Now, while I strongly support Santos's project of an emergent, of, of an engagement with the epistemologies of the South, with uh, other ways of knowing the world beyond the Western mode of understanding the world, I would like to make a contribution to it by posing yet another strong, difficult question as I anticipate, which is the, the idea of playing along with the metaphor of the abyss. The question of what if the abyss goes even deeper than this distinction? And if, what if the epistemological line is not quite invisible enough, concealing its own foundation upon yet another abyssal line, just as modern, just as Western, which is the very distinction between epistemology and ontology, knowledge and reality? What if the left's incapacity to listen to and learn from the sound of the demands of the anti-imperial global south is not only the result of an epistemological Eurocentrism that finds other forms of knowledge incomprehensible, but the result of a deeper, metaphysical Eurocentrism that opposes what these non-colonial languages assume and does not understand that what is at stake is not, the is not just cognitive, but existential justice. The cry, indeed, that a different world is possible and not just a different knowledge. The conception of knowledge as actively representing reality, upon which the very importance for us of epistemology and its critical question, what can one know, are grounded, is in fact a quintessentially modern and Western conception. It is one that can be traced all the way back to Immanuel Kant's Copernican Revolution, where he attempted to reconcile the divide between empiricism and rationalism that through the 18th century governed the field of European philosophy by proposing the transcendental doctrine that the mind actively processes, represents, experience in constructing knowledge instead of just disclosing an independent reality. Now, the thing is that in producing such a synthesis, a profound abyss had also been dug. An abyssal line situating any form of knowledge on this side and any reality on the other. For instead of disclosing eternal truths and the nature of God, as rationalists would have it, or indeed of disclosing aspects of reality, the reality of the world itself, as empiricists would have it, knowledge became the very correlation between the world and the experiencing human subject, between knower and known. The question, therefore, of what we do know became a matter of secondary importance in the face of the question of what we can know. It became secondary, that is, to the question of the transcendental conditions that make knowledge possible in the first place. And at the same time, it entailed a degradation of the world into mere appearance. In other words, into how the world appears to a subject. In this way, there is nothing that that can be said of the world as such that is not said about the world as represented by human subjects. Now, as with the epistemological line described above, the impact of this other line on modern Western imaginations can hardly be exaggerated. As historians of science Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison put it in their, in their fantastic study on the history of objectivity, Kant's synthesis, which involves a reformulation of the scholastic categories of the objective and the subjective, into the modern distinctions we have come to take for granted today, reverberated with seismic intensity in every domain of 19th century intellectual life, from science to literature. Often marked by creative misappropriations of, and misreadings, echoes of Kant's revolution provoked an enormous shift in the ethos of scientific research, from the metaphysical quest of truth to the person, pursuit of objectivity as a distinctly epistemological goal that could guarantee that the inescapable activity of this knowing, leaky subject would not jeopardize the objective, the objective validity of scientific findings. Now, the formation of European sociological thought was, for the most part, I think, not exempt from this Kantian legacy. Often reappropriating Kant's insights by way of a neo-Kantian conception that transposed the former's transcendental conditions of the knowing subject into quasi-transcendental or as we would call them, historical, social, cultural, economic conditions. We can find traces of Kant's gesture in 
all our so-called founding fathers, from Weber to Durkheim to Marx. But more directly pertinent to our purposes is the fact that the profundity of the metaphysical abyss created by Kant also stands at the core of the European traditions of critical thought on which the epistemological critiques of modern scientific Eurocentrism often draw. Indeed, to the extent that they criticize Eurocentric assumptions on the basis that they presuppose, I quote Mignolo here, knowing sub that the knowing subjects are universal, or that the exclusions they effect are, in Chakrabarti's word, uh, words, ultimately epistemological. In other words, to the extent that these criticisms assume that colonial oppression is exerted, above all, over the modes of knowing, of producing knowledge, of producing perspectives, images, and systems of images, symbols, modes of signification over resources, patterns, and instruments of formalized and objectivized expression, intellectual or visual. Such criticisms cannot challenge the modern Western epistemological privilege without simultaneously participating in the latter's way of imagining what knowledge is in the first place and how it connects or fails to connect with reality. Yeah, so in a very nice paper from 2007, Gurminder suggests that a pluralization of other voices in sociology can never be enough, she says, to release the transformative potential of post-colonial thought unless their emergence calls into question the structures of knowledge that have previously occluded them. In the same spirit, in this paper, I make the case that pluralizing other knowledges can never be enough unless their emergence calls into question the metaphysical structures of the imagination that keep the very relationship between epistemology and ontology intact. Otherwise, the attempt to transverse the epistemological abyss may be at risk of going a deeper one. They are at risk, that is, of rela relying on a different kind of Eurocentrism that does not simply affect the structures and categories of knowing, but the entire mode of imagining the relationship between knowledge and reality. One that enables sociological engagement with knowledges from the South at the expense, perhaps, of a more radical engagement with the fact that there may well be no distinction between the knowledges and the realities of the South. 